So I'll start off by just reviewing that the Ontario situation, I think, continues to improve. This is the uh, weekly cases per 100,000 curve for the province. And you can see that that is continuing to come down nicely, just as you know we've been seeing for the last little while. It's slowing down a little bit, but I think that would be expected as we get to smaller and smaller numbers of cases. The reproductive number for the province, I think basically shows that as well, where that reproductive number remains very safely below one sale, which is exactly where it needs to be. The reproductive number again means that for every case of COVID-19, how many people does that one case spread to uh, uh, others on average? And if you're spreading to fewer than one on average, you're gonna get fewer cases over time. Uh, hospitalizations are trending nicely down as well. And we can see hospitalizations are now the lowest they've really been since probably about the mid fall, which is really good news. People in ICU is coming down, not quite as strongly. You can see we're still just barely under where we were at the peak of the second wave and you know uh, maybe not too dissimilar from the middle fall, but there's quite a ways to go down. I think the number today was 333 and the province used to have their danger threshold of 150, which you can see we've been above that threshold for probably a good six, seven months. So a little bit more room to come down there. Looking at what the province's modeling was saying, it you know showed that you know we would be under 500 cases around now, and we definitely are. We're probably actually averaging a little below what they were showing here, where we're probably averaging closer to 300 to 350 cases a day. This is around the time, though, that the provincial modeling showed that you'd see a flattening or possibly an increase. So I think it'll be interesting to see what happens over the next week or so to see. If hopefully we you know, project on this green trajectory where we don't see much of an increase and it stays relatively flat and we don't see uh, starting to increase. If we do see it starting to increase, I think that would be a very big caution to the province around taking the next step into step two of the reopening framework. Looking at the Niagara data, I think there's some good news here. So we'd seen in past weeks where we'd sort of flattened out for a bit and cases were no longer declining, but they do seem to be now coming back down again, which is, I think very good news. And like the province, our case level is now pretty similar to where we were in the middle of the fall. And that was a period where we were able to you know, keep cases fairly contained. So hopefully that'll be the case. We're also starting to get very close to that 15 per 100,000 per week metric, which I've shared as being the line I'd wanna see us fall below before we lift the restriction in outdoor dining and uh, for restaurant dining to being with uh, people outside of your household. So we're hopefully going to be able to cross that threshold in the near future as well. Our reproductive number, I think, is now you can see fallen back below one, which is exactly what we'd expect with cases uh, starting to come down again. And hopefully we'll be able to keep it below one. Hospitalizations, when you look at Niagara Health, you know, they came down for a bit. They've been fairly flat a little while. And unfortunately, we've seen some additional people become hospitalized over the last week in Niagara Health. So we seem to be holding sort of flat there as opposed to seeing the downward trend that we had hoped to see. And then when it comes to ICUs, we are actually coming down quite well. You know, we were at a peak, well over 20 persons with COVID-19 were in the ICU. And I think we're down to about four uh, left in the ICU. So that is certainly some very good news there that there's far fewer people having really severe illness and our hospitals are starting to be able to recover a bit. Um, just want to revisit the story on testing because I've highlighted the last few weeks where our testing numbers are relatively low and I think it's important to get the message out that people should get tested if they have any mild symptoms because we are now increasingly going to be relying on contact tracing to keep our cases down. And we can only have effective contact tracing if we're able to find cases because people get tested. And so, you know, our tests have been coming down, which not entirely unexpected. We have fewer cases, fewer people are going to have symptoms, we're going to have fewer tests. But that testing number still is trending down a little bit. It's slowed down, but it's holding relatively flat at a level that's actually below where we were in the mid fall, which is the last time we had these many cases. It's much more similar to where we were back in the summer when we had zero to two cases a day, it seemed. So I do think our testing uh, tests need to go back up and we need to continue to encourage people to get tested some more. The 
other big story that I have been watching over the last few weeks has been around the variants. And I've talked a lot about the United Kingdom. And this is sort of the, what the United Kingdom has seen in terms of the breakdown of the variants. So this is a graph going to 100%. And this pink color used to be the alpha variant, which originated in the UK. And the purple color is the delta variant. And you can see over, you know, really April, May, and then, you know, really picking up since May, that that Delta variant has really taken over and is now almost all of the cases in the UK. There's very little of that pink color left, which is the Alpha variant. And you can see down here, there's pretty much none of the other colors, so no other variants. That Delta variant really does seem to spread more easily than any of the other variants. And so it has a competitive advantage. It basically takes over. And it's basically now the you know, overwhelming you know, number of cases in the United Kingdom. And we know that this variant spreads more easily, which is why it's able to crowd out all the other variants. But it's also a little bit more severe, it looks like. And people are more likely to be hospitalized if infected by this variant. And so that makes it a very big concern, because if it's more easily spread, it's going to be harder for us to control and harder for us to reopen because this infection is going to keep spreading if it shows up here in large numbers. And of course, if it's causing more hospitalizations, that's going to again put our hospital sector at risk, even though we might not have quite as many cases of this variant as we might have in the alpha variant through our last wave. And if we take a look at the story in the you know, United Kingdom, you can see very much that their overall cases daily are continuing on an upward trajectory. And that's a direct consequence of that Delta variant now dominating their cases, that everything that they had, which previously was able to keep cases relatively flat, is no longer enough because that Delta variant spreads more easily. And so it is now causing cases to once again rise in the United Kingdom. And of course, the United Kingdom, as I've mentioned in past weeks, was one of the world leaders in terms of getting vaccinations done. Um, they had one of the highest first dose vaccinations. We've managed to beat them in Canada by a little bit, but they still have far more people vaccinated with a second dose. And so this, I think, shows that vaccination on its own will not necessarily prevent COVID-19 from you know, spreading again if that Delta variant comes here in large numbers. Just showing you the comparison of what the Ontario trajectory looks like, and you can see that, you know, the UK is almost halfway to the peak of our last wave based on what they've seen in the increases over just the last maybe three to four weeks. Um, taking a look at what the Delta variant looks like here in Ontario, and I've talked about in past weeks that we don't have a uh, screening test for that Delta variant. So we're really relying on the, you know, sequence uh, to see what um, the sequencing results show for the small sample of tests that are sequenced. And then we're assuming that if a case is not identifying any other variant, probably it's the Delta variant that's growing there because as we saw with the UK, the Delta variant is going to crowd out everything else. So if it's a variant we can't detect, it's probably the Delta variant. And we can see that, you know, We've continued to see this decline in identifiable variant cases, implying that there's this growing segment here that are undetected variants, which are probably the Delta variant. And we probably have a good 25 to 30 percent of cases in Ontario now are that Delta variant. So it is slowly starting to pick up. And as you remember from the UK, it was really, you know, you know, a couple of months it took for that Delta variant to become completely dominant. And so We've had about a month of that Delta variant building up. We're maybe a month away from seeing something similar to the United Kingdom in terms of having the Delta variant really be the majority of our cases. In Niagara, the story around the Delta variants maybe been a little bit better lately. Um, this is what it's looked like. But as you can see, over the last uh, week or so, we've had a de uh, um, decline in our identifiable variants implying that we probably have the Delta variant starting to take hold here as well. And probably a good, you know, six, 7% of our cases may be the Delta variant based on this. Now you've probably seen the province's announcement that there are some Delta variant hotspots, which include Hamilton and Halton region, as well as Waterloo region. And so I think it's perhaps not surprising that if there's some Delta variant hotspots nearby, that's going to make it more likely Delta variant is going to come into Niagara and you're going to see some cases due to the Delta variant here. And so I think that's exactly what we're seeing. 
And just to kind of put into perspective what the delta variant prevalence looks like in those hotspots, you know, I'm just going to redraw this graph. You know, this graph had a you know a compressed um, scale here, starting at around 86 percent, just so I could really show the difference here. If I now go to a you know regular scale from zero to 100, and you know I'll draw in what that Niagara curve looks like there. It's obviously much less appreciable with this uh, larger scale. If we look at the Ontario curve, you can see obviously Ontario is seeing on average far more of the Delta variant than we are in Niagara. But if we take a look at our, those neighboring regions to us that are hotspots, this is what things have looked like in Halton. So you can see that they weren't too far from the provincial average at the start of June. But over the course of the last couple of weeks, they very much diverged from the provincial average. And you can see how they really are a hotspot where probably close to half of their cases now are that Delta variant. In Hamilton, um, pretty similar story. They were starting up not too different from the provincial average, and they've now come down, and they probably have over 50% of their cases are that Delta variant. And then you've probably heard of Waterloo, which is seeing continuing high numbers of cases there. They you know, continue to see 40, 50, 60 cases a day, even though their population is not that dissimilar from ours. And this is what their uh, identifiable variant curve looks like. So they have come all the way down to only probably 15 to 20 percent of their cases are identifiable variant, implying that at least 80 percent of their cases now are the Delta variant. And the Delta variant has basically become completely dominant there. And when we see them continue to persist to have, you know, 40, 50, 60 cases a day and not really seeing that coming down, I think that's because they're trying to fight the Delta variant, which is more difficult to slow down and stop spreading. And that's why they're not able to get their cases down. And I think that's the risk we see in places like Hamilton and Halton, and possibly even in Niagara as that Delta variant builds up more and more. And of course, the best thing that's gonna help us get a bit of more of the upper hand against the Delta variant is gonna be getting people vaccinated with two doses of vaccine, because two doses of vaccine seems to be very effective against stopping the Delta variant. The one other thing I just wanna point out is the pattern that we see of where the Delta variant is and who it's infecting when we go back to the United Kingdom. And this is the age breakdown that the UK is showing for Delta variant cases. And you can see that the peak of that uh, case wave of when this age pyramid is in the 20 to 29 age group. The next most likely group to get infection is the 10 to 19 groups so of the teenagers. And then as you go to you know 30 year olds, 40 year olds, it starts to taper off. So this Delta variant very much seems to be affecting younger people. It's probably affecting younger people because this is a group that is less likely to be vaccinated. The UK, like us, rolled out vaccines for the elderly first, so they have fortunately gotten protection. And so there's some good news here showing that if you are vaccinated, you're much less likely to suffer from the Delta variant. But given that there's a large population still unvaccinated, the Delta variant is able to take hold. And if we look in, obviously, in Niagara, we still do have a lot of um, people unvaccinated. Obviously, the Delta variant hasn't yet really taken hold here in Niagara, but I think it's nonetheless interesting to look at our case curves when we break it down by age. And you can see that all of our age groups seem to be trending down, but the group that's coming down the slowest is that 20 to 39 year age group. Uh, that group's really been the you know, highest all along in terms of cases. So infections tend to spread amongst them, but as they're the last group also to be vaccinated, they're going to be the most susceptible to Delta variant, not just because they lack vaccination, but also that tends to be where cases have concentrated. And I think part of the way we're going to be able to make sure Delta variant doesn't get a foothold here is to get this group vaccinated. Because if this is what's driving infections within our community, if we can get them vaccinated, we can slow down the spread in that group it's going to have a spillover effect of the Delta variant being able to spread throughout our society. Now, I think this group, you know, 40 and under represents about 40% of our population, but they're actually 60% of our cases right now. So there's a disproportionate benefit we can achieve in terms of uh, preventing cases in Niagara if we get that group vaccinated. And if we take a look at our current vaccine coverage here, we can see you know, that 18 to 29 year age group is not really even at 50% of that population vaccinated. There's a large group of those who still need to be vaccinated. 
Even the 30 to 39 year age group has quite a bit more room to grow, almost 45%. And the teenagers, lots of room for them to grow. So I think a big priority for us in the next little while is to get these groups vaccination coverage higher and then get them their second dose eventually as well so that the Delta variant isn't able to spread amongst that group, is not really able to get that foothold there. And that'll slow down the Delta variant being able to gain an upper hand here and allow us to really tame the ability of that infection to spread. That's not something it looks like the UK had the opportunity to do, but thankfully we have the opportunity to learn from them. So I think a priority for us needs to be to get this group vaccinated. Unfortunately, what does make that more difficult is with so many groups opening up for vaccination for their second doses, we see the very enthusiastic older groups very quickly booking into any appointments that open up. And we're not necessarily seeing as many appointments for this younger group. Uh, you've probably noticed we have a couple of town halls this week because we're trying to make a real uh, to for younger people to help answer their questions around vaccination, because we really want to try and get this group to sign up for vaccines. One final note I'll make is that, you know, we do seem to have, you know, around 4% of this group, around 2% of this group booked for vaccines. So there's a few more in the queue. And these numbers are actually very similar to what we had last week. So it seems, you know, as we vaccinate more people, we do have more people slowly signing up to get vaccinated. And I do wonder if part of the challenge for these groups is that these are relatively younger groups Maybe in some cases, they're young families, they have you know, complicated lives, they're not able to plan very far ahead. And in many cases, young people are more of the instant gratification generation. They're used to mobile phones, they wanna buy something, they go on Amazon, they buy it, they're done. They're not gonna wait around. If they want to look up something, they look it up on their phone, they're done. They're not gonna wait around and you know, go to a library and pull a book. They're looking for instant answers. And so if they don't have an instant appointment, they're maybe not going to book into it. And as you know, people get vaccinated, you get closer to some open bookings, some more people book into those, and that's a sliding scale. And so I really wonder if there's a, you know, uh, as we slow down vaccinating the elderly groups and there's more appointments available in not two weeks out, but maybe a couple of days out, maybe we'll start to have more success getting some of these groups signed up for vaccination. And so that's something I'll be looking forward to as we hopefully get a lot you know, of uh, appointments up in the next couple of weeks to see if we can maybe get past those early adopters who want to sign up for appointments and maybe have more appointments not so distant in the future that maybe we're able to get some younger people signing up for those. And so that's my update for this week. Now I'll turn it over to questions. Okay, thanks, Dr. Herji. Um, so we will start our roundtable of questions and follow-up questions. And up first, we have Paul Forsyth. I'll just unmute you one second. There you go, Paul. Can you hear me this time? Yeah, you're good. Oh, good. Thank you. Um, well, thank you. Uh, uh, and Dr. Herji, do you think we're on track to meet the, um, the vaccination goals of the uh, second and third phases of the reopening? I'm looking at the numbers. We seem to be in pretty good shape. Yeah, so if you look at the province's thresholds, they think they had 70% of adults have a first dose. We are at a good 75, 76% of adults at this point actually have their first dose. Oh. And for step two, it is 25% of adults have their second dose. For step three, is 25%. We have across a 20% threshold for adults having their second dose. So we've definitely met the vaccination thresholds for that second step. And Within a few days, I expect we'll be at the vaccination thresholds for step three as well. The key thing though to note is that while the vaccination thresholds were the ones that the province put explicit numbers for, there is that asterisk, which I think is actually really important that we also need to see what the trend is for cases, for hospitalizations and for all of our other metrics. And we need to see those continue to have a downwards trajectory. And I think actually that's more important than the vaccination metrics is that we need to see that cases are remaining under control. Uh, right now, that looks to be the case in the province, but we've only been open for about nine or 10 days. I think it usually takes two weeks to start to see what the impact of reopening is. It'll be closer to three weeks until we're able to look back and see over a few days what has happened. So I think it's too early to know if we're gonna be ready to reopen still. I think the province should be very cautious about uh, reopening too quickly and really wait those three weeks to make sure that everything is trending in the right direction. Because the last thing we wanna do is replicate what happened in the United Kingdom. 
And a follow-up, Paul? I think you had mentioned this, uh, Dr. Herji, in, in your uh, your comments that uh, if this the Delta variant does take over Niagara, which it probably will, uh, and it's a high infection uh, rate, uh, I think you you had mentioned the idea the idea that the province should be flexible to be ready to scale back or push back the phasing uh, if things like hospitalizations and ICU rates start to climb up again. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the first thing you'd want to see is the cases uh, going up again, because obviously people get infected and a few days later that reflects in hospitalizations and ICUs. So I think if we saw any hint that cases are starting to go up or even flatten out, that should give the province pause not to reopen too quickly. I've talked a lot about, you know, that trend we saw in the last wave where cases would look like they're coming down, but the variant was building up in the background. And I think that's exactly the situation we find ourselves in. I think we're a lot closer to being a stage where we have the majority of our population vaccinated, but we need to make sure that we get to those people being vaccinated before we really let the uh, things open too much and allow that variant even more opportunity to spread widely. Okay, thanks, Paul. Um, up next, we have Alan Benner. Alan, you should be able to unmute now. You there, Alan? Hello? Yeah, I can hear you now. Uh -huh. I'm back on, sorry about that. Okay, okay I was looking at the uh, epi epidemiological summary regarding the uh, uh, average uh, 15 cases per 100,000. Uh, today we're at 14.82, uh, which is obviously below the 15. Um, at the same time though, I mean, and we're seeing um, the, uh, for the past few days, the reproductive rate has been creeping back up I mean, a few days ago, it was at 0.64. Today, it's at 0.77. Um, you know, if you're seeing that numbers increase or, you know, starting to trend towards increasing, is there concern about lifting that Section 22 order? You know, that reproductive number will bounce up and down a little bit day to day. It's not a super stable number. If you look at that graph, it's a pretty, you know, jagged graph. It doesn't really have smooth lines. So I'm not too concerned about the shift there. If we're starting to get up to 0.9, uh, which is, I think, outside the kind of daily variation we've seen, I think that would be much more concerning to me. Um, I am, you know, want to make sure we are, you know, very clearly under that 15 threshold. We have, uh, looks like it dipped below that today. We do see that as we update our numbers every day, sometimes that number actually gets adjusted upwards again. So we'll see what it's looking like over the next couple of days, but hopefully if the trend continues, we are hopefully getting close to the point where it would be possible to lift that restriction on dining with only your household. Key thing though I wanna say is that obviously when we do that, we are giving more opportunity for infection to spread. And it remains really important everybody stays vigilant. And to the extent that they, you know, it makes sense for their lives, maybe voluntarily avoid out dining with others um, because you know that is gonna create opportunity for infection to spread. And we are seeing the Delta variant really being a challenge in some other neighboring regions and we don't wanna see that here. And a follow-up question, Alan? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, wondered um, then about you know the timeline, and, and certainly keeping an eye, I suppose, on that reproductive number and seeing if it if it, it does just you know uh, if it's just a fluctuation, or if it's continuing. I'm wondering, um, I suppose, if if that would be Delta variant related, and how long we're we're going to have to look at these uh, um, numbers and ensure that they're remaining consistently below the threshold before uh, um, we can. Uh, make all those politicians happy. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm not expecting that we'd, we need to see it stay below those metrics for several, uh, for a large number of days. I think a small number of days uh, would be enough to feel confident that we have actually met those metrics and it's not just a one day blip that we've fallen below it. Um, so we'll look over the next few days and uh, if things look good, we'll hopefully be able to make a decision. Thanks, Alan. Up next, we have Phil Perkins from CH. You should be able to unmute now, Phil. All right, thanks, Dr. Hirji. Um, so 
I'm just interested, you know, we keep talking about the, the Delta being the, the dominant strain. Isn't that inevitable anytime there is a new strain? But the only difference is as the days go on, more and more people are getting vaccinated, particularly people at risk are getting double vaxxed uh, because of the way we've rolled out these vaccines. So if Canada mimics the UK and, and younger people are getting the Delta variant, assuming they've had their single dose, what is the risk that it'll really make that much of an impact on our healthcare as long as the people who are the most vulnerable, who are the ones who are dying, are double vaxxed, thus well protected against the Delta? Yeah. So, you know, a, a variant that spreads more easily than others, as you say, will inevitably eventually become dominant. The whole question is how quickly it becomes dominant. If there's very little to slow the spread of infection, it's going to basically take over very quickly. If you have a lot of things in place to slow down the spread of infection, it's going to take longer for it to get there. And I think what you talk about is, that, you know, getting people vaccinated and then double vaccinated if that's going to protect from the Delta variant. So if we can slow down the Delta variant becoming dominant long enough that we can get most people having two doses of vaccine, that's basically the goal here. It's to slow it down long enough that we can get most people vaccinated with two doses of vaccine. Because as you say, once we do that, then the vaccine is actually protecting us. It's making sure that people aren't going to be hospitalized in any large numbers. It's making sure that people who do get sick from COVID-19 are going to be few in number, and uh, it's going to limit the number of people who have those long-term health effects from COVID-19 that sometimes get experienced. So it's all right now about slowing down that Delta variant taking over so we can actually get the vaccines out to everyone. And a follow-up question, Phil? Yeah, uh, what's the science? Because the CDC is saying not to do it unless there's a supply issue, like mixing vaccines, whether it's Pfizer or Moderna or vice versa. So what is the science that that we're being told or, or, or researching ourselves that it's okay to mix a Pfizer with a Moderna or, you know, Moderna than Pfizer or AstraZeneca and any of the mRNA vaccines? Yeah, so this comes out with the National Advisory Committee on Immunizations, which is our expert scientific body. And they've made the determination that these two vaccines are interchangeable. And the logic there is that these two vaccines actually work the exact same way. They're both mRNA vaccines. They're providing our cells with instructions to create that spike protein, which is that protein that sits on the outside of the virus. And by doing that, it trains our immune system to recognize another that when the virus comes in, that it has that spike protein so it can attack it. And you're basically providing that same training to our cells, whether you give the Pfizer vaccine or you give the Moderna vaccine. So if you've done a dose of one, if you do a dose of the other, you're providing the exact same priming to our immune system. We have a huge track record of doing this with other vaccines. You know, uh, measles vaccine, you get two doses of that several years apart. Most people are probably not getting the same brand of measles vaccine both times. And in fact, right now, our vaccine schedule in Ontario would actually effectively require you don't because you get a combined vaccine for your second one, whereas it's a straight MMR vaccine for your first one. Uh, hepatitis B, people generally don't end up actually getting that same product for their first and second and third dose, they'll end up getting different ones. So the interchangeability of vaccines is actually a very standard practice when you have a vaccine that operates in the same way. It's just now being applied to COVID-19. The difference here is that, you know, people when they get their MMR vaccine, they don't know, is it a GSK vaccine or another company's vaccine? Did it when you get your hepatitis B vaccine? People really don't know what company made it. Uh, with COVID-19, there's just been so much focus on vaccines. Everybody knows that they're getting the Pfizer brand versus the Moderna brand versus the AstraZeneca brand. But, you know, with other vaccines, we wouldn't pay attention to that. And vaccines would be mixed and matched as needed to make sure people got the right immunity. And so we're just basically taking that principle and applying it here and just taking a little bit more, I think, education and informing the public, just given that they've been so focused on those brand names thus far. Thank you, Phil. Um, up next, we have Penny Coles. Penny, you should be able to unmute now. Um, Dr. Hirchi, I'm sorry to ask you to go over this again. I know you've told us before. You spoke today about the metrics, the one particular metric that would uh, move you to lift your section 22, but there are other metrics that you will be looking at, is that correct? Uh, no, it's really just two metrics that I'm going to be looking at. So it's the weekly cases per 100,000 population and the um, 
uh, reproductive number. So just those two metrics are the ones I'm going to be looking for. And, and as Alan Banner said, we're basically at the 15 per 100,000 per week, it looks like possibly, and we remain below one for the reproductive number, which is what we wanted to achieve. And a follow up, Penny? Uh, yeah, that, that's good news. The other, uh, hopefully, piece of good news we'd like to hear is um, you're still encouraging uh, people to sign up for vaccinations, especially young people, and hopefully there will be more appointments available. Are you optimistic about the supply of vaccines coming to Niagara? Uh, I'm very optimistic about the supply over the next two to three weeks, where there's going to be a lot of vaccine, there's going to be a lot more appointments. Don't really have any insight from the province of what's going to happen beyond, you know, maybe the second week of July. So can't speak as confidently about that, but I'd be hopeful that at least we'll be at the level of vaccination that we have seen over the last few weeks here. And I think, you know, basically with the big influx we're getting over the next few weeks, we're probably going to be able to move up vaccinations by almost a month here in real time, which is really good news. Thanks, Penny. Um, and finally, we have Richard Harley. Richard, you can unmute now. Uh, I actually don't have any questions. Most of mine were asked and uh, it was very comprehensive. So thank you very much. Okay, great. Thanks, Richard. Um, if anyone would like to ask um, a final question, can you please let me know in the chat and then I will unmute you. And while I'm waiting for that, just a reminder, uh, we're going to go bi-weekly after this. So we won't have a session next week, but we'll have one the following week and every two weeks after that. And uh, we'll update your meeting invite with that. Okay, I don't see anyone wanting to ask another question. So thanks again for uh, joining us this week and we will see you all again in two weeks. Thank you.